Everybody in the place, let me see your face. Say, my be the book. Everybody in the place, let me see your face. Say, my be the book. Counting me, all in, got a boot to the queen. My be the book. She's the wickedest thing you ever did see. My be the book. You know, she lives in the crib down the basement street. My be the book. She's the best of all the facts in your tour has got to see. My be the book. But if you cross a man, don't make that girl mad. My be the book. The girl that puts some money you wish she never had. My be the book. Oh, Maria. My be the book. Louisiana State. Oh, Maria. My be the book. Louisiana State. You better be ready to rumble with Marie the Bull one time. You better be ready to rumble with Marie the Bull two times. You better be ready to cry for Marie the Bull three times. You better be ready to cry for Marie the Bull four times. You better be ready to cry for Marie the Bull three times. You better be ready to cry for Marie the Bull four times. You better be ready to cry for Marie the Bull three times. You better be ready to cry for Marie the Bull four times. You better be ready to cry for Marie the Bull three times. Yeah, we go kangaroo, ran a whole house with it all out, with it all out. Everybody knows she bang, bang, sick, picking and bang, bang. Everybody looking at her, kind of strange, but she still kept her game rolling. Everybody was smoking, smoking, choking, losing focus. Ass for blocks, about to throw up. So these spells, everybody gonna blow up. My beat of Oh, my free up. My free Good evening and welcome to this evening's program, Voodoo and Spirituality in Black Masking Traditions. I'm so thrilled to be able to be with you all here in this virtual space. Um, as I'm sure you're familiar and aware, we initially intended to host this program in person at the Presbyter. Um, and while I'm sorry that we can't be together, I'm grateful to each of our panelists for their flexibility and to each of you for your flexibility and still joining us tonight for what I think is gonna be a really rich and wonderful discussion um, of, of some amazing traditions, important traditions in this city. Um, a quick note that we are recording tonight and we will send this recording to everyone who registered tomorrow along with a brief survey that I hope you will fill out to help us continue to offer programs that are of interest. Um, my name is Sarah Lowenberg. I am the manager of education here at the Louisiana State Museum. I want to thank the Friends of the Cabildo and the Louisiana State Museum for making this program possible. This evening's program is hosted in conjunction with the current exhibition, Mystery in Motion, African American Masking and Spirituality in Mardi Gras, which was co-curated by Kim da Vaz Deville, our moderator tonight, and Ron Veche, who I think I saw on the call. Um, a quick note to please keep yourself muted during the program. Sound travels differently in this platform, as we all know, so we may mute you at some point. It's not because we don't want to hear from you, simply the nature of the platform. Before we get started, I also want to quickly plug a couple upcoming programs. Next Thursday, August 12th, we'll hear from author Daryl Barthé Jr. on Becoming an American in Creole New Orleans from 1896 to 1949. And on Thursday, September 9th, we'll hear from author Sophie White on her recent book, Voices of the Enslaved, Love, Labor, and Longing in French Louisiana. I'll send out information about both of those programs and how to sign up um, with tomorrow's email. Um, a quick run of show for tonight. We're gonna start with an opening clip of Big Chief Alfred Doucette, who you also just heard singing Marie Laveau. 
um, and then a song from Miss Lee, and then I'll turn it over to Kim to kick us off and introduce our panelists. Um, we'll have a great discussion amongst each of the panelists and time for questions and answers at the end. So if you have questions along the way, feel free to use the chat and we'll aim to get questions answered. Uh, thank you again for being here. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our video clip of Chief Doucette. Bola bo masia, inke ne bo ila ila, simbo masia, e jaliya. I'm gonna finish the song. It's a song of togetherness from Senegal, well, West Africa, from the Wolof people, and they sung it anytime royalty was coming to the village or any time royalty took a space or a seat in the village. It means come together to witness and experience the wonderful kings and queens and courts and royalty of our people. Wola bo masia ninke ne bo ila ila simbo masia E jaliya tunda na di mai mai son tu ne na ti si mai wo la bo masia E jaliya Thank you Good afternoon everyone thank you so much uh, for being with us this evening. The uh, exhibit, Mystery in Motion, uh, has uh, many different spiritual aspects that we have been able to feature. And in addition to looking at how Black maskers have incorporated from their own spiritual spirituality, either traditions from Islam, Rastafarianism, Catholicism, the Pentecostal church, uh, we, we, we have been blessed with being able to do a panoramic of spirituality to highlight how diverse African-American spirituality in masking has become. Tonight, we are taking a deep dive into voodoo spirituality as it manifests in New Orleans. And we're privileged to have our panelists, Kishana Jones Lee, the Divine Prince Taya Mecca, Big Chief Alfred Doucette, and Cinnamon, Risa Cinnamon Black Basil. And I'm Kim Vaz. I'm the co-curator of Mystery Emotion, and my co-curator, Rhonda Shea, is also with us tonight. Next slide. 
Debates about the mythology surrounding Marie Laveau by New Orleanians seemingly uninvolved in voodoo mark Laveau as a figure in voodoo as a cultural artifact in the collective consciousness of the city. So when we think about Louisiana and New Orleans in particular, one of the women from our past that we often think about no matter who we are is a legendary spiritual woman and entrepreneur, Marie Laveau. Because voodoo developed as a spiritual system among those least powerful in Louisiana, its origins are not well documented. While some scholars trace it back to traditional religions such as the Awe, the Fawn, the Yoruba, and Congo peoples in Africa, and see evidence of it as late as the 1700s, other caution against ascribing a direct connection. While the full history of Louisiana voodoo awaits further research, we do know that its practice has had a significant influence in the spiritual life of New Orleans, where voodoo was regionally distinct until the 1940s, um, but is now heavily influenced by the voodoo of Haiti, where it remains a prominent religion. Voodoo beliefs and rituals are intertwined with Mardi Gras masking traditions. Since at least the 1800s, skeletons or the skull and bone gangs have been part of black carnival. Often dressed in black costumes painted with white skeleton bones, the maskers act as both carnival town criers and spiritual guardians. Rousing their community before dawn on Mardi Gras, their signature warning is you next. During such treks, Bruce Sunpai Barnes, the big chief of the Northside Skull and Bone Gang, recognizes Papa Ogu, the god of iron and warfare, and the Haitian voodoo spirit of the family of Gating, who are the guardians of the cemetery. Queen Kalinda Laveau, a voodoo, a voodoo priestess who is also in our show, Mystery in Motion, brings spirit medicine to black masking activities. Her society, the Mystic Seven Sisters, continues a traditional healing work of generations of women. They sometimes accompany the Northside Skull and Bone Gang to the tomb of the unknown slave at St. Augustine Catholic Church in the Treme neighborhood as the gang summons and embodies the ancestors. Traversing the streets, the women provide prayers and energy for a safe day. Of course, the best known historical practitioner of New Orleans voodoo is the legendary Marie Laveau. Devout Catholic, a, devout African, a devotee of African spirituality and voodoo and a community leader. In our show, we have been able to highlight Big Chief Alfred Doucette of the Flaming Arrows suit in honor of Marie Laveau, as well as a song that we have heard today. And I wanna call your attention to someone who also figures prominently in my thinking about black masking and Marie Laveau, and that's Cardell Patterson, flag boy of the Uptown Warriors. Both of these have made suits in honor of this esteemed figure. Next slide. This is Cardell Patterson, flag boy of the Uptown Warriors in Mardi Gras 2016. His suit was dedicated to Marie Laveau and Congo Square and the gatherings of Indian and Native, Native Americans and African enslaved people and free people of color uh, in Congo Square, observing their rights, creating culture, creating um, New Orleans, um, the sound of New Orleans, the look and feel of New Orleans in our cultural traditions. Next slide. Cardell says, to explain why we mask, Marie Laveau is an iconic connector between free people of color, the enslaved and the pow and power. There are differences in experiences between enslaved and free, free people of color. And so his patches on his suit are reflecting these differences. The two in the middle are free people of color. It pays homage to the unknown enslaved ancestors He's calling attention to the power of the enslaved to bring about the Haitian revolution. He recalls in this suit, the connection between New Orleans and Haiti, and he expresses continuities between people of color gathered in Congo Square on Sunday and African uh, Americans who continue to rejoice on Sundays with Indian practices and second lines. So this evening, um, Oh, and one last person. While some maskers honor the voodoo past, others infuse carnival with contemporary voodoo spirituality. 
the divine prince Taya Mecca leads the house of the divine prince of Voodoo Spiritual Church. He seeks to bring lasting healing to his tribe and community on Mardi Gras as big chief of the Black Hawk Voodoo gang. He makes patches for his suit that resemble Haitian voodoo drapeau ceremonial hand stamp sewn sequence flags. And we'll hear more from him today. It's my privilege to introduce our panelists. First is Kishana Jones. Lee, a world now renowned actress, singer, educator, casting director and arts administrator and religious culture bearer from New Orleans. She has a BA in theater and performing arts and speech communication from Dillard University and an MA in arts administration from the University of New Orleans. She's performed plays including uh, Broadway's Ain't Misbehaving, Shaking the Mess Out of Misery, we need that one, and for colored girls who have considered suicide when the rainbow is enough. And she has sung with Shades of Praise, New Orleans um, interracial, interracial Racial Gospel Choir, the New Orleans Black Chorale, and the New Orleans Opera. She's a practicing Catholic and she studied has studied various African traditional religions such as Zifa and Udanini. Jones Lee has been a member of the crew of Oshun for five years and serves as a public relations officer. She participates as a writer in Zulu parades and she's done that for over 20 years. And it is her um, artifacts that we have on display in Mystery in Motion, the exhibit. The Divine Prince is a high profile psychic spiritualist advisor, practitioner, minister, and sought after voodoo practitioner um, in New Orleans. He's been a resident of New Orleans for 23 years and is an actor and cultural performer in the historic Treme neighborhood. He's a longtime member and advisor to the Congo Square Preservation Society, and he's a black masking Indian. As a former evangelical minister of music, the Divine Prince has been ministering in African traditional religious systems for more than 35 years. He has been featured on Buried Worlds with Don Wildman, uh, Monstrum, and Atlas of Cursed Places, among other movies, TV shows, and documentaries. His suits are featured in the current exhibit, Mystery in Motion. We're blessed today to have with us Big Chief Alfred Doucette, a lifelong New Orleanian and man of many talents. He's worked as a carpenter, a race car driver, a horseman, a nightclub owner, a musician, and a black masking Indian. In the 1970s, he and his brothers owned the nightclubs Nightcap One and Nightcap Two, which hosted such acts as the Meters, the Neville Brothers, Marvin Gaye, and Deacon John. As race car builders and drivers, they were the first African-Americans to integrate the track at Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and they raced in Louisiana, Texas, Alabama, and Alabama. Big Chief began sewing suits as Black Masking Indian in 1989. In 2001, his Marie Laveau suit depicted a graveyard scene of the voodoo queen. He was inspired to create the song Marie Laveau in 1998 after the revered voodoo queen came to him in a dream. Big Chief has performed songs from his Marie Coming Out EP with acts such as Bambula 2000, James Andrews, Trombone Shorty, Dr. John, Cyril Nevels, Kermit Ruffins, and the Dirty Dozen Brass Band. He's performed at venues around the city and at the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival, the French Quarter Festival, and the Satchmo Festival. And we have two of Chief's suits um, in the exhibit. And I really encourage you to come and have a meditative moment with both of them. It's my pleasure to introduce Riza Cinnamon Black Bazil, who's a cultural ambassador, an entertainer, big queen in the spirit of Fayaya and Mandigo Warriors Black Masking Indian Tribe, a voodoo practitioner and reader at the New Orleans Historic Voodoo Museum. She's a cultural consultant for documentaries, film industry projects, and media outlets such as ESPN, Spike TV, the Travel Channel, and Fusion.net. She was also the producer of New Orleans Live, which aired on cable across um, channel NOAA TV. She has danced with um, the Nkufu Traditional African Dance Company and Casa Samba, a Brazilian dance company, both based in New Orleans. She masks as a renegade style baby doll and has masked with the Gold Digger baby dolls and the Teiva Ernie Cato baby dolls. She is masked with family and sister groups and has founded several groups of baby dolls, including um, uh, the well-known Treme Million Dollar Baby Dolls. 
And so I'm welcoming all of our panelists to our conversation this evening. Next slide. Beautiful. So first we'll hear from um, Big Chief Alfred Doucette. Um, bear with us for a quick technology moment. Um, Emily, are you there? Can you hear us? Or we'll come back to them. There's a lot that Zoom can do and a lot that Zoom can't. <laughs> I'm gonna try in the beginning. Can you hear us? We can hear you twice. Hey, no. oh. Yeah, let me turn my phone. There. Yeah. All right, now try. We may have double muted them. Thank you all for being with us for just a minute. Emily, you want to try unmuting your computer? All right, well, we heard them for just one brief moment, um, but they'll come back. I think maybe we'll move on to our next panelist and then we'll come back. So um, bear with us, but, but we'll, we'll say it'll be a fun return. Sorry about that. Okay, you ready? Hi, my name is Kashana Jones Lee, and I'm a culture bearer for the city of New Orleans, Louisiana, and the public relations person for Oshawn. I have written with Oshawn for five years, and the way we do our royalty is based on the West African Orisha spirits. Here you see Miss Cinnamon Black. Who is my sister? Oh, we're the million dollar Tribe baby dolls. We danced together in Kafo. We've been together at the hip for almost all of my life. She's representing one of the Orishas. And the royalty in Oshan is based on the Orisha. This would be a shoe in the red. And it also represents the Egungun, which is the family, the ancestors. And that's what the people are to us on Mardi Gras Day. Our queen is known as Yemenya. Some people say Yemenja, but it's Yemenya. We have different pronunciations for the name, but the spirits know what you're trying to say. And our king, we can move to the next slide, is named Shango. Here you see me, Cinnamon Black, and a drummer. We do ritual before each performance. Um, our captain is Mr. Henry Smith, and the captain emeritus is Miss Ann Clark. You can move to the next slide. O'Shawn is the first African-American all-women's crew in the city of New Orleans, which came out of Ashanti, which was mixed. So um, it's an all women's crew. We do accept men and children, but the actual club are, is women. These are a picture of some of our children. You'll see my three with the red dresses on. We call those princesses of Yemen Ya. The two on the left with the white outfit or kings and queens pages. They're usually really young, like toddlers. And just as in the African tradition, they are overseen tightly by the king and queen or the mother and father. The guys you see are named after Shango and they are called the sons of Shango, which means that one day they will go up to be king 
and they will take their rightful place in their community. So they're the sons of Shango. The, the older child, girl you see in the back row, we call the daughters of Oshun. Oshun is what may be to Greek mythology and other mythology as the goddess of love. So those are the daughter of Oshun. They're up and coming debutantes. They're coming to be um, young ladies and it's a sweet time in their life, which is a lot of milk and honey. So you'll see people when they talk about Oshun, which is a goddess, Orisha goddess, that she's very sweet and very motherly. Yemenya is the great mother and she is over everything. So once a person is queen, you can move to the next slide. In Oshun, they go to Yemenya. This is an example of the Oshun court. You have the queen and then you have the goddesses. And I'm wearing red today because for some reason, for four years, in my float, I have the goddess of love. We have the goddess of fun. We have the goddess of health and wealth. And we usually have 13 goddesses, which is an uneven number. So all the colors of the peacock. And we know that the peacock is represented by Oshun, who is would be referred to as the goddess of love, sweetness, milk, and honey. And here we have our queen from two years ago because of the pandemic, Queen Joan Ann Brown was queen in 2019. You can go to the next slide, if there are any. Here are some more pictures. To the right, you'll see Captain Henry Smith. He always has a new outfit every year. He is the captain of the crew. We're very, very, very family oriented. Standing with him is my escort and he is in line to be King of Shango when I'm queen in two years. And that is Mr. Adrian Lindsay. There you have our current reigning king, Mr. Cardell Stewart, who is a master professor musician in the keyboard and several instruments, retired from Nord, retired from the school system from teaching music. And then the last picture on the left, you have Queen Joan Ann Brown with the captain and the king. And the captain is masked doing the coronation. You can move to the next slide, if there are any. Here's another picture of princesses. The princesses do go to workshops and learn etiquette. That's a picture of me and my twins. I'm the goddess of love, so I have on red. But they learn how to properly eat, how to be a young lady, things that you would learn in the community, period you know, just how to act in society. And it also plays on a positive way to uplift them. They have something to look forward to. We're very, form we're very family oriented. So we want them to be able to go up in the crew and be proud in the steps they take as they're growing. Next slide. Here is the altar. And, I, and this is what we telling about the different religions. I study Ifa. West African religion, I'm a practicing Christian Catholic. I'm also a minister. And we make this altar very sacred because this is a St. Joseph altar. And he is the father of who we believe in Christ. And so things that we give, you might see us, we have a picnic, so we honor fruit and vegetation. We do that in the summertime, thanking God for giving us fruit, for constantly giving us food, for bringing us up bringing us to, together. And this was particular at our rings. A group of us meet there for the St. Joseph altar from the crew every year. And you'll see the fish, you'll see different breads. The same thing you see in the St. Joseph altar. And you can see it, but here I have it here. I don't know if you can see it. Our signature throw are fans. So all the goddesses, everybody cannot throw the signature throw. The goddesses will throw the signature throw, and those are fans. Again, it all comes together with New Orleans tradition from Haitian voodoo to West African religion and culture and Christianity. We mix it all in the pot traditionally, not just commercialized, that it might mean something to the up and coming children and students 
that are up and coming in the crew. They pay a fee. If anybody is interested in riding, let me know. We would love to have you. We have several events throughout the year, dances and everything that the community can take a part of. And we would love to have you. I think that's it. That's the end of the slides. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. You'll hear from um, the Divine Prince. Am I unmuted? Can you hear me now? Great, yes. Greetings, greetings. Peace and blessings. I am Voodoo Chief, the Divine Prince, Black Hawk Voodoo Chief in terms of uh, masking Mardi Gras Indian culture. I'm also an activist, an actor, cultural performer. Um, I wear many hats. Uh, I'm truly grateful to be a part of this, this audience and this uh, event. Uh, I appreciate this picture being my first uh, demonstration. Uh, Papa Fan Fan, West, uh, I'm sorry, Haitian voodoo practitioner, may he rest uh, in heaven. Uh, of course, our beloved Marcus Akinlana, who is a Awo in the Ifa Yoruba tradition, and uh, voodoo priestess, uh, Ava K. Jones, who's also initiated in both Ifa and Haitian voodoo, as well as a strong supporter of uh, retaining and promoting Louisiana, authentic Louisiana and Mississippi Delta uh, voodoo. So I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak and to share. The bebe that I'm wearing uh, represents Papa Gede uh, and a little bit of um, uh, Baron Samdi. Uh, they are sort of shadow sides of each other, if you will, but they both represent the realm of the dead, uh, the realm of the ancestors, if you will. And, and I teach and believe and live by the philosophy that our ancestors indeed are our first line of defense uh, in all things. And science has now come to support that idea in that they support that ancestral memory survives in the blood, survives in the blood. So indeed, we carry these voodoo traditions with us in the bellies of these enslaved ships uh, uh, through the Middle Passage into the New World and carry indeed the traditions and the spirit and the fire of voodoo with us. Uh, there are many misconceptions that uh, benefit some people to continue to promote that somehow uh, there was no voodoo in New Orleans or voodoo came from Haiti. Uh, but indeed, almost 100 years before the Haitian Revolution, the first ships arriving from West Africa were coming from the Bight of Benin, were coming from Togo, Benin, the, the, Niger, the uh, Nigerian regions that contain uh, voodoo practice, even until this, this day. So I, I want to make sure I include that um, in my demonstration. Can you move on to the next photo for me? This is uh, myself and my wild man, Joshua Nyland Tanner. We are actually participating in a voodoo ceremony, a documented voodoo ceremony here uh, at my house. Uh, voodoo priestess Kalinda LeBeau and several other elders and, and, and leaders were with us in, in this ceremony. Uh, this picture is probably three years old, maybe four, but I think three years old. Uh, I also wanted to demonstrate the incorporation, how I incorporate uh, Black masking tradition. Uh, egun is how I draw the line. Egun, egungun is a Yoruba word for bone, but symbolizes the dead, symbolizes the ancestors. So some of you may be familiar with egungun, E-G-U-N-G-U-N, egungun, masquerades in West Africa. And indeed, our suits, and particularly my maroon suits, uh, resemble strongly uh, Egungun masquerade suits, Galede, which is our great mother, masquerading suits that you find in the uh, Benin, Nigeria, Togo region. So indeed, we absolutely incorporate uh, voodoo, Orisha, Black spiritualist practices in traditions along in our carnival demonstrations. Uh, we like to come out and, and chase away the devil and clear the way uh, for other masking tribes to come out and then return home safely. Somehow, somehow we often uh, end up with uh, uh, Big Chief Fayaya. <laughs> so we're internally grateful for uh, Big Chief Victor Harris uh, and his demonstration as a role model uh, and a mentor. Can we see our next photo? 
This is again myself and my wild man, uh, Joshua Nyland Tanner. This is the year that we filmed with Big Frida for her reality TV show, Big Frida Bounces Back, Big Frida the Queen Diva. Uh, we certainly were grateful for the opportunity to not only you know, continue to reintroduce uh, New Orleans tradition uh, into the mainstream uh, uh, community, but also voodoo, uh, and particularly this Blackhawk voodoo, which we demonstrate. Uh, this was Mardi Gras morning. Uh, we had it arranged where uh, uh, Big Freed, if many of you remember, rolled with Zulu that year. Uh, and we sort of met up uh, at her house to give people a, a, a greater idea of what carnival, Black carnival really is uh, for us and in our community. So I appreciate my opportunities to not only present our culture in entertainment, I've done American Horror Story and many other entertainment-based productions, but also the documentaries like uh, PBS Monstrum, like the Travel Channel, like History Channel, Buried Worlds, uh, and the other documentaries that I continue to be a part of. Um, so I'm grateful for the opportunity to be a performer, be an entertainer, be an artist, but to also uh, continue to carry the truth of, of the history and the tradition and the culture uh, beyond just uh, the local uh, audience. Next, please. Uh, this is myself uh, again on, I think this is a Super Sunday with Big Chief, uh, by, uh, Big Chief uh, Yellow Pocahontas, uh, Mahmoud Duro, uh Montana. I, I believe this might be the year he retired or maybe the year after. Um, I'm not sure quite the date. This is my Black Hawk suit. This is a suit that I built with Black Hawk in mind, Black Hawk prayer, song, ritual in mind. Uh, I literally breathed smoke and fire and, and energy and, and sprayed water and, and liquor and rum into this suit uh, as, as a process of its uh, creation and its building. Uh, even though I am a former Yellow Pocahontas uh, medicine man, uh, Voodoo Chief, which doctor, medicine man, uh, I still maintain a flat B style, which is typical of, of more uptown Indians. The downtown Indians, and particularly Yellow Pocahontas, are known for three-dimensional suits. Uh, so I try to add uh, three dimensions by adding uh, bone, uh, mirrored glass pieces. Um, there's silver. There's a silver um, Native American indigenous uh, cross, if you will, uh, right in the middle of the the medicine man. The medicine man there is a traditional symbol found among many uh, indigenous tribes to represent the medicine, if you will. So I'm very grateful for my opportunity to work with um, Yellow Pocahontas and Daryl Montana uh, and the energy that he breathed into me as I continue my journey uh, in Black masking culture. Next, please. Uh, again, this is myself and uh, Daryl Montana. This is my very first year masking with uh, yellow Pocahontas. Uh, I was nervous. <laughs> I was stressed. Uh, how do you, you know, mask with a tribe, a legendary tribe uh, of such artistic uh, mastery? I didn't want to be uh, embarrassed. I certainly uh, maintained my flat bead style, but I added a little three-dimensional elements to my mask itself and just saw how I constructed my crown um, and how I sort of pieced my suit together. Uh, but I felt I accomplished my goal. Uh, both Sabrina and uh, Daryl were literally brought to tears uh, when they saw me that morning. They had never seen the suit. They had no idea what I was going to look like on Mardi Gras Day. So um, I'm, I take great pride in that purple suit. Uh, there's a, a legendary piece on the back that you can view at the Presbyterian Museum of the Queen Quet of the Gullah Geechee Nation in the Carolinas, uh, the Sea Coast Islands of the Carolinas, another uh, indigenous uh, maroon community, if you will. Uh, so as a maroon, I was a former guardian of the flame with uh, Sharice Harrison Nelson. Uh, and then I went on to be with uh, Yellow Pocahontas and Daryl allowed me to maintain sort of my title and, and position my energy, my, my individualism uh, so I brought my maroon energy uh, by giving that place to Queen Quet 
uh, that year on the back of the suit. Uh, it's one of my more favorite uh, pieces. Next, please. Oh, I think it's Reese's turn. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you great. Thank you. Oh. Well, good evening, everyone. And, and I guess I have been exposed. My real name is Risa, Risa Bazio. I am better known as AKA Madame Cinnamon Black. I am with the tribe of Fayaya and the Mandingo Warriors. And there I'm known as Voodoo Baby Doll Queen. And uh, as you can see in the slide that we're looking at, uh, it, it, it looks the same as if that. Uh, I give, I would like to give uh, acknowledgments to my upbringing in voodoo. I am considered a spiritualist, uh, a voodoo priestess of New Orleans voodoo. Uh, I was uh, initiated by the late Dr. Elmer Glover. Uh, I practiced under Madame Ava K. Jones, who was a very well-known, and still is, throughout the world of, of New Orleans. I also understood it under uh, Miriam, Mother Miriam over in New Orleans here, and several other practitioners. I'm presently working uh, daily uh, at the Historical Voodoo Museum in New Orleans, Louisiana, in the heart of the French Quarters. And there I'm doing consultations, tours, making green, green bags as I'm sitting here talking to you, I was putting together. Um, and I'd like to thank you for having me on the show, Miss Sarah. Uh, this gives me an opportunity to let people know about I guess voodoo in New Orleans, you know, mostly a lot of people don't know that voodoo is inside the food, the music and the drinks. So if you're sitting at home watching this program and you're eating some food or having some drinks here from, um, from New Orleans, <laughs> we've already got you. It's, you know, the voodoo is in you now. I think the first slide that we're looking at is, um, is one of our performances that are performing at, uh, his, at the Jazz and Heritage Festival. And my tribe that I perform with is a very, very spiritual tribe. Um, it's called Fayaya, and my chief name is uh, Big Chief Victor Harris. I don't know if that's not on a slide, but this is what he looks like right here. And that's it. Yeah. And um, as you can see, um, masking and using a lot of voodoo inside our costume is something that we do. And um, we don't think about it, we just do it. It's inside. The it's inside our upbringings, it's inside our souls, inside our spirit. And as you can see um, from the slide, I'm doing a performance here with uh, Katrina. I'm doing a blessing performance. Uh, the snake, well, a lot of people are afraid of the snake. You know, they see snakes and they say, oh, I'm going to run. But it's all accident. Have they ever been to the doctor? You know, have they ever been to a drugstore? Have they ever seen an amalam? Because when you go to the doctor, there's two snakes. You know, that's called the Gadusa. And there's a male and female snake. One, the male is called Dambala, and Idawida is the female snake, and the combination of two can be healing of the world. At the drugstore, there's a snake. Uh, there's a snake on the back of the Amanans. And if you really, really want to know about it, there's a snake on the bottom. Of the Virgin Mary. You know, they have a statue of the Virgin Mary, and she will have a two little horns like this here on the bottom of it, which represents the foot of the snake and it represents the healing of the earth. So I consider myself a spiritualist, um, a healer. I've worked with Kishana. I've worked with um, um, Big Chief Doucette that we have on the panel. I've worked with Prince Yamansi. We've done rituals, uh, performances, and it gives us great pleasure to, to have our exhibit at the museum. And we'd like to invite all of you to come by and see it. So let's see what we have on the next slide. Uh, this slide is showing um, uh, after doing a ritual and a blessing for the city of New Orleans, right after, right before we just had a hurricane. Rituals are done here in New Orleans quite often. Our rituals are unlike no other place in the city. Uh, we do a ritual of us uh, of having second lines, which happens as the first lines with the rib from the funerals. You know, the funerals are 
or something that you do when somebody dies. Here we have a ritual of feeding you. You know, we'll have altars set up where we'll have fruit and oranges and all kinds of things that we give from the spirit. Um, masking in the city of New Orleans has always been something that that a lot of people don't understand. They say, well, well how do I do that? It's, you're normally invited into it. You don't just put it on. You are, you just, you're invited into it. And you're brought into it by blood, by your families and things. So we use a lot of spirituality and we don't even think about it. You know, as being an actress and an entertainer here, I learned that Louis Armstrong was one of the people. He would go to the graveyard and he would get the bricks, the red bricks from the cemetery. And he would rub them together and he would collect it in a bucket till he got a bucket full of red brick dust. And he would go in the French quarters and he would sell it to everyone for five cents. And they would sprinkle it in front of the door to protect their families or to protect their business to bring them money. That's always in history. Is there another slide? Uh, this is a slide here after performance doing working at the historical Voodoo Museum where I'm normally making a lot of Grigri bags. Grigri bags is, is part of New Orleans Voodoo and the part of the New Orleans history and part of Voodoo across the world. Um, most bags are held inside, the, are held in the hand and women carry them on the left hand side of the body and men carry them on the white right hand side of the body. Um, this one is made for love. And inside these Grigri bags, there's normal herbs, spices, sometimes bones, you know, or sometimes coins or certain stones that have certain energies to create a certain power. Uh, this one is for the audience. This is a blue one. And this is for good health, good health. And we're in a pandemic here in the city of New Orleans and we need all the greenery we can get. Next slide, please. The Tomb of the Unknown Date is something that, that's here at the St. Augustine Church in the city of New Orleans in the heart of in the heart of the Treme. And a lot of, a lot, of, we give homage to the slaves that were here before us They've been through a struggle. And so we try to use that within our costume. Then on the slide that you're looking at is, is after a church event at the St. Augustine where we were doing a ritual outside. This location that you're looking at is normally visited uh, several times throughout the year with the communities where you'll see different types of costumes. The Indians visit here, the sisters visit here, the, the Catholics are here all the methods, everyone is here at this location. Um, we would like to let invite you out to come and see it and to understand what it means to be able to pray, to give homage and how important it is. Next slide, please. Uh, we do the masking and what you're seeing here is my last year suit. It was quite an effort to make this. This represents the sun goddess um, in New Orleans and in my tribe. A lot of the spirituality is, is explained to you throughout the elders. And the elders, which, which is Big Chief Doucette, is one of our elders. And also in our tribe is, is Fayaya, Victor Harris. And he explained to me that this year it was very important that I would see the world through my heart, through my soul, and not to use my eyes. You'll see that we use kairi shells. Kairi shells represent a lot in the spirituality. It represents the soul of the people. At one time, it was considered a fertility shell. Uh, it was also used for money. Today, we use these shells in our costume and our design to represent the spirits of our ancestors because we are doing a reenactment of our ancestors. When we put these masking costumes on, we are not just having fun. It's very serious, it's very spiritual, and we spend a lot of time within prayer when we make those decisions. Is there a next slide? That's, that's, those are your images. So we're gonna try and one more time to hear from Big Chief Alfred Doucette. Um, so Emily, if you are on the call, we'll see if we can succeed this time. I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Thank you all for being with us. 
connection down. Can you hear us? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm glad. How you doing? It's great. To, I'm going to spotlight y'all. We don't have a video, but that's okay. No, I can't spotlight. It's great to hear from you, Chief. Can you see the images? Yeah, I see the pictures. Okay, great. You'll introduce yourself. Yeah. I'm Big Chief Alfred Dusset, Mighty Gras Indian Chief down, down here in New Orleans. That's the, that's the, uh, <clears throat> that's the picture of uh, Prince of Peace, yeah. That's the, the Prince of Peace. I, I built that Indian suit with, uh, with the idea in mind, maybe that would help to stop some of the violence we have in on the street. People respect Mardi Gras Indian chiefs. I had uh, brought this 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 type of Indian suit to the street to try and maybe make, make a difference in what's happening in my town. Beautiful. Well, you know, uh, I had I had like. Four different artists to try to draw this this uh, circle for me, and a, and an old lady said, "Just use the clock system." And I thought that the building Bill drew it, and I was able to sew it. You know, you know, a lot of stuff I do myself. Some of some of the stuff you got to have other people to do uh, for you, and it's, it's good to share. You know, it's good to it's good to grow somebody in, in the culture. A lot of people uh, disagree with me on, on, on some of the stuff that I do. But uh, I mean, I'm 80 years old and my life has been great. And my dad and my, and my friends around me always share. And he told me to share. That's what I've been doing since I've been uh, able to do stuff. And this, this particular Indian suit, you know, like uh, I had a lot of recognition. I got a lot of, a lot of, Kumba. A lot of people fell to their knees when they saw me in the city. Give me this next uh next slide. That's the clock system. When 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 you tell me about the clock system, I came and drew it up and, and I brought that to to the artist and get it for me. This is strange fruit. I had a dream about a lynching. And I was driving from AutoZone and I saw some people with some feathers and I asked them, I said, y'all getting ready for Sunday? Said, yeah, we got a second line. And he said, are you, are you sewing? I said, I got, had a dream about a lynching. And uh, the old lady says, you need to listen to uh, Strange Fruit, Billy Holiday, Strange Fruit. So I went by one of the baby dogs, Moline Campbell, and pulled it up on the computer. And when I heard the song, this is the suit that I come up with. Uh, I, like, I like my suit to tell a story about the past, uh, keep it on people's mind because like, we got a lot of differences in, in this world today and we can't go back to where this was. We can't go back to change. We can't go back to people in the woods. We can't, we can't, you know, we can't go back to uh, being, we can't go back to being in chain. And, and, and today we got a different kind of slavery than we had then. We have handcuffs and shackles and people that's falling into that, into that bag every day. Young people that's just being wasted. Uh, well, I'm, 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 I'm trying to explain, you know, what's happening with these young people today. You know, like we need, we need more teachers. We need more people handing up on these young people, letting them know that uh, 
A lot of people died with chains on them for them to be free. My 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 chest piece you're looking at. You're looking at the, 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 the slave ship, the auctioneer, the two policemen, and all the black people in chains. They're naked. They brought them from Africa. And uh, they found them some wealth and fortune and riches and to bring back to Africa and they put them in chains and taught them how to grow the crop for them to make, make their riches. So my sisters tell stories. And, and I try to bring it to the street that way so people can recognize that we don't need to go back to this. We need to go forward. My, uh, my, my real boat, go to the next picture. This Indian suit, my real boat. My real boat came to me three nights in a row. I was asleep, I mean, in a good sleep. And, uh, Gave me the words. Now, I'm a carpenter. I'm a lot of things. I'm a lot of things. I got 15 different trades that I can do that I have done in my time. But I wanted to be a singer. And I never did do no singing. And had all kinds of opportunities to be a singer, but never was. But Marie came into my dreams and woke me up. And three nights in a row, I was singing this song in my sleep in the fourth day I had the whole song in my head that you heard earlier. Marie wants to be heard, that's what I said. Because all the I got nine songs. All all of songs come to me in three. All the power that I have with my music comes in three. Uh, she wants to be heard. I don't know if she's using me, my song, my music. Give me this music to sing to, so she can be heard. But she dreamed, you know, like, you know, Marie really talks to me only in my dream. I, you know, I don't get mad with nobody. She said, I got you back. And she do. You know, I, I, I live a decent life. I live a happy life. Uh, I, a lot of people love me. Uh, I'm a comfortable, I'm a comfortable man for 80 years old. And you know, I'm healthy. I do what I want to do. And I think it's the, I think the spirit, the spirit uh, that I believe in. You know, a lot of people don't believe in the spirit, but you gotta have the spirit in your body. And uh, you know, you, without the spirit, you can't live. You have another slide? Right here, this is a, a crown piece I'm making. Sitting down there sewing, trying to uh, represent New Orleans. I, I wrote all about New Orleans on this on this headpiece. That's the headpiece from Marie Laveau. Go to another slide. That's the end of mine. Um, there was a question for you, though, Chief. If you could comment on the list of the positive and negative lists on your arms in the first suit. My, by my roosters, five in the morning when the rooster crow. Five, oh, 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 the comments on my, on my arm. Oh. Yeah, on this on your arms. I can't see them. No, I can't, and I don't remember, I don't remember that, and I, I really can't see them. Okay, one is, um, one is, um, positives, it looks like. It says things like love, pray, work, morals. And the other arm has things like thou shall not live without the spirit, hate, kill. So one is thou shall and one is thou shall not, it looks like. Right. Well, I, 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 remember, I remember one statement that, that, I, that I made for young people don't be a perfume, but uh, uh, a friend of mine, a girlfriend of mine uh, wrote that those uh, words for me, and uh, I told her, I said, "Don't be a buffoon." And uh, she wrote buffoon, but what I what I meant was, you know, you know, we, uh, the society had young people making babies to get money, and uh, you know that was that was all together wrong. Look what we got today. We got a bunch of we got a bunch of young people with young young people, and 
You know, when I was coming up, I had some everybody to, to try to teach me something. If they didn't, if I didn't pay attention, I got a spanking. But you can't do that no more. And you know, like all these these babies making babies are uh, acting like a buffoon. You know, uh, I was trying to tell them stop. Uh, but I can't see the uh, the other write up so I had on it. Thank you very much. Um, I think I'll turn it back over and, and thank a comment saying thank you for answering the question. Okay. I'll turn it over to you, Kim, um, and we'll move into discussion. Okay. okay. Um, so one of the things before we right before we move into discussion, I, I'm hoping that you all can think about um, how voodoo uh, has been co-opted and commercialized by New Orleans as business. Can you go to um, so there are businesses in New Orleans that use voodoo to sell um, to sell music, to sell Dixie beer, to sell Abita beer, to sell Zappos potato chips. What are your thoughts about how voodoo is just used, um, you know, outside of its religious context, especially for the commodification and profits? of people who don't live in our community. Who's right there? Cinnamon, can't, can't hear you, Cinnamon. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. I think I, you know, I remember back when uh, Dixie Beer tried to uh, sell sell their beer, and it was like really prohibited. And people all across the country, according to history, were scared to buy the beer, you know. But today, the understanding of voodoo is it's much more clearer, you know. I feel in a way that that is kind of good, but then there's this part inside my soul that says, well, maybe they shouldn't be doing that because they're misleading people. They're making them think if they eat the chips, they're gonna you know, win the lottery or something like that nature. So I, you know, I kind of feel like it's okay, but then there's one part of me that says, no, it's not. I am, was the cassette consultant for CW Networks, the originals, which was um, placed in New Orleans. And I used to translate the Haitian Creole and voodoo rituals, and I got Emmys for them. I got two Emmys for my scenes. I think that there's a time and a place for everything. And the ancestors do not like mockery. Right. You will be punished for it. They don't like it. It's not tolerated. They understand innocence. You know, like people are ignorant. So it's a certain innocence to it, but not if you market chips or a festival or a drink and you think you're going to get all this power. If you study to show yourself approved, like in the Bible and in Haitian texts and in voodoo texts, then you will understand it's not what you think. Nobody is eating the head of children and all this other stuff, and there's no blood sacrifice on your door, and how they deface Marie Laveau's grave, and it's going to get you these superpowers. And people, after watching those episodes, I use the original, appreciated the religion more. They understood that it wasn't scary, and it's not what they thought it was, and it was very similar to Catholicism, because when we came here, we had to hide our religion in Catholicism to be able to live everyday life in peace. I think that it's now it's time to have a serious conversation about why are you using the name and these antics to market and sell your goods? And are you benefiting the community or are you making a mockery out of religion? And I know Priest um, Divine, I know he has some thoughts on this. I, I do. Um, <laughs> as an actor, professional actor, SAG card carrying actor and cultural performer, 
um, and a musician. That was my first love was, was the piano and music. I draw a very thin line between, but stable line between entertainment and religion, ethno-cultural religious tradition. I also want to bring awareness to the fact that often um, the actors and performers are being exploited, you know, in some of these performances, whether they be for music videos, television shows, movies, uh, TV commercials, you know, et cetera. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a great example. You know, I, I did a, a, a commercial for a beer. beer. Uh, they went on to cartoonize my image, uh, turn that image into a white man, and then put it on their purple haze beer. Uh, and of course, I don't get not a penny mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, for, for the representation, you know. Um, so we have to be more uh, in control um, of our representation. Uh, Kishana is, is kind of behind the scenes. She has some opportunities to affect that. I'm often um, reached out to to be a consultant about movies, TV shows, et cetera, specific to voodoo and, and, and ATR, you know, ritual. Um, it has not always gone so well. <laughs> you know, uh, I've had to walk away in some occasions. I've been asked to walk away uh, in other occasions because I, you know, just wouldn't flex on the bastardizing, you know, of our tradition. Um, there's a degree of um, assimilation, synchronizing uh, that has happened over the years um, by force, but by condition. I like to remind people that south of the border, you know, there was a relationship between the Catholic Church and those enslaved communities to allow them to accept all the tenets of Catholicism, but we'll let you do your voodoo on your downtime. And that's why Andable looks so organized in Brazil. That's why Lukumi looks so organized in, in Cuba. And what we do here still continues to be bastardized. So I have a problem with the bastardization that somehow we're not connected to the root. Somehow there's no real voodoo tradition here. And it's, and it's all just, you know, hoodoo and trickery. Uh, I think Cody Roberts has a book. I can't remember the name of the book right now that even speaks to Marie Laveau. Um, and, and some people might feel that she even introduced a degree of her, her and Dr. John Montanay and others of that time period introduced a degree of performance element to the culture. So yes, we perform, we drum, we, we do it in Congo Square, we do it at our, our theaters around town and we do it for everyone. We, we do it for the community. But I think it's too easy, especially today with the internet for the young people to assume that they're seeing real authentic ritual and practice. So they believe they're learning what voodoo is when they watch American Horror Story. They believe they're learning what voodoo is when they watch the, the original. And then I often have to dispel those witchcraft, magical ideas, you know, and, and lead them back to something that's more rooted and grounded in tradition. Along with us being forced to go underground, because you know we could have been beheaded, mutilated, killed for reading, for gathering, for drumming, for doing anything like that, you know, in, in the in the deep south, say for Congo Square, of course. But even in that space, we were limited as to how much of our sacred tradition we could do out loud and out in the public, you know. So it was a, a meeting place for many ethnic groups. I've done a great deal of extensive uh, study and I'm appreciative of the Whitney Plantation for their yeah. archives about who was here, what ethnic groups were here, right. what families were brought from the Bight of Benin here uh, to establish voodoo long before the Haitian Revolution. I, I say, and I'm gonna pass the mic, uh, if we could count in Fon, if we could count in Airway, we were only now being forced to learn how to count in English, Spanish, French, Portuguese. And if we can remember how to count, then certainly we can remember our drum patterns, our dance rhythms, our ritual days, our ritual cycles. So we, we didn't forget our voodoo. We were just forced to take it underground. And that voodoo is in every so-called American religion. And this, what I'm about to say is, is a little controversial, but I offer that there would be no Christianity in America, if it had not been for the spirituality and the fire of the enslaved Africans. It's in the shop, it's in the dance, it's in the music, it's in the foot washing, 
You know, it's they in took the, everything. Yeah, it's in the circle dance. You know, they took everything. They took yeah. everything. It's in everything. It's in but everything. I think when it, I, so it's here. I, Kim, we didn't I have lose a question it. or a comment. Who's this? Greta. Greta Vidal. Oh, okay. Hi, Greta. Go ahead. Hi. Okay. Um, thanks for both your comments. Um, I attended voodoo uh, parties for the spirits in the Northeast, uh, Montreal, Boston, primarily New York, places like that, where most of the community was immigrants for a bunch of years. And when I first came to New Orleans six years ago, I thought, oh my gosh, voodoo potato chips? We don't have these up north. <laughs> I'm really curious about this identity of New Orleans as a voodoo city, even just through consumption. Um, Prince Ty, I have been wondering who that face on a beat of beer was. It's you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does it, well, my question is, I guess, does it kind of normalize things in some way? For example, when I was in Boston, we invited a mambo, uh, Mad Marie, to give a talk at Harvard Divinity School. And it was the first time that I know of that someone had done a voodoo party for the spirits there. It was a big deal, but it was behind closed doors. And I come here to New Orleans and people are doing it in a park, in um, along a bayou, in the lobby of a hotel. So there's some way in which the city accepts voodoo community in a way that other immigrant, that other cities in the US and Canada and the Caribbean, where most of the communities are descendants of more recent immigrants, doesn't. And I don't know what that has to do with the commercialization. I'm also curious how voodoo beer and everything here intersects with, many of us might have a t-shirt or a bookmark with the Virgin of Guadalupe, right? That Mexican Virgin has been so commercialized. I want to Frida throw Kahlo's that. images. Yeah, tell me. I'm just going to throw it back to our panelists. I think you have a great question about the commercialization and the popularization of these questions. So I want to just, we're going to have time for questions in just a few minutes, but I want to give them a chance to wrap it up before we come back to it. So thank you for the question. I'm going to throw it back. Um, okay. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I absolutely uh, see the dichotomy. I do accept uh, what Keyshawn has said and what uh, Cinnamon Black said to some degree, uh, that it has become more popularized, popularized. Uh, we can do, uh, quote unquote, Ifa, Akan, Voodoo, Sangoma practice sort of out in the open now. But again, my concern continues to be with the availability of books and botanicas, particularly because botanicas often are selling these products that have a label, that have a copyright on it, you know, that's got a brand on it. But there's not a whole lot of teaching and instruction about the tradition going on. So again, you have a, a younger and a, a less educated community that thinks that the voodoo is in this candle or it's in this deck of tarot cards, you know, without really understanding what Odu is, what Fa, Afa, Ifa is, how we consult divination in the tradition. And, and so that's my concern. Yes, Benjamin. Um, my, my concern about the products is the fact that the festivals, the voodoo festivals, the, uh, the voodoo beer, and the cosmic, they are not, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, my concern is that they're not, they're not actually hiring the artists or the people who are actually know about voodoo so they'll know, they'll know the proper things to do and the, the things that you shouldn't do. They're, they're hiring imitators, people who know nothing about voodoo, and they're having them perform. Oh, she just got muted. Unmute, Cinnamon. I don't know how you got muted. Unmute, Cinnamon. She's good. Yeah, she's good. Go ahead. I, you know, I think I think it's something that should be considered. If they're going to have a voodoo festival, then they should come and talk to the voodoo community or get someone from the voodoo community to even bless them for even trying to use something like that, or even the advertisements and things of that nature. You know, the voodoo potato chips and things. 
But if they're going to use that, then they should use someone in the voodoo to make sure that they're doing the right things. You know, I think that's something that should be considered and something that should be done. Okay. All right. Well, we have questions coming in. Thank you. We could talk about this and we need to talk about this. Um, we need to think about uh, the way that these um, names are just being, you know, I mean, like the way voodoo is not treated on par with Christianity, we wouldn't have Jesus chips. People would be in an uproar if we had something like that. Right. Um, should should this be added to the, the name changing going on with the Confederate monuments in the school? Right. Street? Yes, it should. You know, I think, yes, this, I, think, I think this notion of voodoo, which is so sacred, um, needs to be added um, to our list of um, eradicating white supremacy in our symbols. And where well, does we, this- we should be res- We should be respected in why it's being done. Um, you know, they should come to us and ask us questions. Don't just do it. Right. When you look at football teams, the Redskins, uh, uh, other teams, there's certainly a move in the in the nation to sort of uh, normalize doing the right thing as yeah. well ethnic groups and, and ethno-cultural practices and traditions. Right. So I'm in agreement. Some of that needs to be pulled way back. Yes. All right. We're going to turn to our um, questions. We've got a few coming in. Sarah, do you want to read? We've got some great questions coming in through the chat. So thank you to everyone participating. Um, first um, question was, do any of you facilitate voodoo classes for Black people that want to reconnect with tradi- their traditions, especially outside of New Orleans, um, but curious about within New Orleans as well? Yes, I most certainly do. Now, I, I will say politically, I, I tend to be politically correct. I'm uncomfortable with the word classes. So no, I don't just teach classes, meaning anybody from anywhere in the world can't come and take a and, class. And, yes. and just, no. um, right. I'm serious about commitment, if you will, initiation, if you will. Even in going into the church, you take the right hand of fellowship, you know, which is a commitment, you know, going into the church. Uh, so I honor, you know, and respect initiation, the sanctity of, of bringing people into our um, culture. And, and again, in this modern context, with all the uh, uh, competing entertainment-based energy online about voodoo, you know, love spells, help me, you know, get my mojo back so I can hit the lotto, you know, I feel like I have an obligation to educate that this is an, uh, as uh, Kim was suggesting, this is religion. This is ethno-cultural sacred space that needs to be respected. It's not just, you know, quick magic. I'm not even comfortable with the idea of quote unquote folk magic. You know, we are in, right. again, it seeks to cut us off from our Akan roots, from our Fan roots, from our Ewe roots, from our Yoruba roots, from our Igbo roots. And once upon a time, even in our community, we generalized. I remember in the 70s, it was all about Swahili. But but how many of us really had DNA from, from those ethnic groups? Right. And so I, I believe the usage of modern DNA has helped to move the conversation forward in terms of us getting that much more specific about who we are. And that's why I appreciate uh, Whitney Plantation's archive of uh, slaves and their ethnic origins, because that again ties us back to this practice. Yeah. Sarah? I agree with Oh, Cinnamon, did you have something you wanted to add? No, I just was, I'm simply agreeing with what he says. Okay, good. I didn't want to cut you off. Um, This is actually a question for uh, Ms. Lee, which she may be stepping away, but I think this applies to others as well. Um, This um, person asked, why do you choose to practice the Catholic faith with the knowledge that Christianity, as you said, took everything from indigenous faith practices like voodoo? How does it enhance your spirituality to do so? And I think also if others want to add in, I know, for example, Chief Doucette have talked about your suits that represent both Christianity and um, voodoo, but I'll, I'll kick it first to Miss Lee if you're there and you're muted, just so you know. Okay, what was the question again? I had a hiccup. I went out for a minute. What was the oh, question? Oh, okay. The question was, why do you choose to practice um, the Catholic faith? the knowledge that Christianity took everything 
from the indigenous faith practices like voodoo and how does it enhance your spirituality to do so? Okay, I not only practice Catholicism, I also practice Judaism because it is my ancestral walk because I have done my DNA. And so I'm on the walk of the ancestors. And when I did my genetics, my family are Igbo Jews from Nigeria. They are Africans who are Jewish, which was the lost original tribe of Jan. So I observe all the Jewish holidays. My ancestors also were Catholic and they hid the Haitian voodoo and they hid the condom blade. And we have documented documents of this in Catholicism. So when I'm practicing it, I'm practicing my faith in voodoo also. So I practice both. It's specific to my calling. I come from a long line of healers and it's specific to the walk I have to walk on this earth. And it goes back to the classes. I wouldn't just have a general class. I would educate people on the right and the wrong of general and traditional aspects of the dis diaspora. But it depends on your personal walk and your purpose for being. And so that's why I practice Catholicism. That's why I observe Odinini, which is an Igbo religion like Ifa, and Voodoo, because it is the walk of my ancestors. Does that make sense? Hmm. Yeah. I just want to throw it out there, Chief said, if you have anything you'd like to add about how you use both Christianity and voodoo in your suits and in your practice. Um, and you are muted. Let's see if we can get you unmuted. Yeah. Well, you know, one thing I would like to say about the voodoo that I, that I know about with Marie Laveau is the, the desecration of her tomb site. You know, people people go to her tomb site and they mock, they put X's and all that on her tomb site. You want to go talk to Marie, bring a bottle of water. There's a there's a three on the ground. And you turn the bottle upside down and put it on the three and talk to her. And when the water's out, you do go about your business. If she's gonna bless you, she's gonna bless you. But don't go there. Don't go there uh with a with a marker or paintbrush. She don't need that. You know, that, that, that's not how you get to talk to Marie. And that's how I've been talking to Marie. I've been there a few times, talk to Marie. That's what I know about Marie. Thank you. Uh, and just a note, just a note, Marie Laveau is my ancestors and, uh, and Cinnamon's ancestor. We have a birthday party for her at her house on St. Anne every year. And she does not like that desecrating the graves. It's the abomination of it. Right. That's just a, that's just a tomb site. She's just moved, you know. Uh, right. That's a spirit is there. Right. It don't need to be. It don't need to be that spirit. Right. Uh, Chief, could you tell us uh, the story of that suit? Um, um, it's not just, um, you know, Marie Laveau's tomb, but it's also your men from your tribe? Well, mighty God moaned when the rooster crow, I send my, my spy to go get my queen, Marie Laveau. I got a wild spy in the flag on my apron. Uh, we, we start off from my house on mighty God day and we go through the neighborhood looking for all the Indians to play. And we wander all around this, this whole town and Indians who just act like a clown. You know, we have a lot of fun on Mardi Gras Day, and, 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 and my my thanks to Marie, she allowed me to go out and play with the guys that I never knew, I, I never would have met probably in life and wouldn't have met for Indian suit. Life has been good for me in the Indian suit. Life has been great for me since I met Marie Laveau. I don't know a whole, whole, whole lot about Marie Laveau's spirit, but I know a lot of people worship her. Worship her. And, and uh, she's, a, she's a good spirit to me, and she's my guardian angel. Anytime I, I have a problem, I call her Marie. I don't get mad with nobody. I don't hate on nobody. She handles all my business. That's what I know about Marie before. Okay. Cinnamon, I think you had something planned. We have to begin to wrap up. I think you had something planned uh, for well, our closing. 
Yeah. Well, in close, basically in closing, um, I want to thank you guys for having us here on your panel and able to express how we feel about the voodoo and the products, uh, how we express the voodoo in our clothing, how we live voodoo in the city. You know, it's in plain sight, actually. A lot of times people just don't see it. As I said before previously, it's in the food, the music, and the drinks. And um, I basically want to just leave you with, with a healing scenario because I, I, I knew that healing comes from within the heart, within the spirit, within the soul. And because of our expressions, people are able to see our wonderful costumes. We're able to see the spirits and all the hard work that we, we do. And this hard work comes from the hard work of our ancestors who were forced to practice Catholicism by their slave owners because we used to run from that red cross. You know, now today we do something a little bit different. We run to the red cross. So before in closing, I want to go ahead and light this candle so that I'll be able to light the hearts and the spirits of those who are watching this program. And they, that you will remember the things that you heard here today and the things that you've seen and to know that spirit lives only once and it lives behind. So I want to close with Katrina because she's, you know, she, she is a healing spirit. The snake is something that believe, that represents healing, the life, the life of voodoo in the city of New Orleans. Right on, son. Many blessings to those. May you expect voodoo to be real because we are real in what we do and what we hear and what we see. Thanks, Big Chief Doucet. Thanks, Kishana. Thanks, Prince Imansi, for expressing your thoughts. And thank you, those who are watching our show. Come and see me. I'm here at the Historical Voodoo Museum. Maybe I can answer another question for you. Um, Divine Prince will um, lead us out. Oh, we can't hear you. Preach. Can you talk? Huh? Can you hear me now? Yes. My apologies. I thought I would end um, with a short song, but more about the history. I wanted to talk about Ico Ico. Ico Ico is a much covered New Orleans song that tells of a parade collision between two tribes of Mardi Gras Indians and the traditional confrontation. The song under the original Giacomo was written and released in 1953 as a single by James Sugar Boy Crawford and his cane cutters, but it failed to make the charts. The song first became popular in 1965 by girl group, the Dixie Cups, who scored an international hit with Ico Ico. In 1967, as part of a lawsuit settlement between Crawford and the Dixie Cups, the trio were given part songwriting credit for the song. In 1972, Dr. John had a minor hit with his version of Ico Ico. The most successful charting version in the UK was recorded by the Scottish singer, Natasha England, who took her 1982 version into the top 10. Ico Ico became an international hit again twice more, the first being the Bell Stars in June 1982, and again with Captain Jack in 2001. The song was originally recorded by and released as a single in November 1953 by James Crawford as Sugar Boy and his Cane Cutters on Checker Records, Checker 787. The single features Dave Lusty. And tenor sax on tenor saxophone. Crawford's version of the song did not make the charts, however. The story tells of a spy boy, my spy boy and your spy boy sitting by the fire. The song tells of spy boys encountering each other on uh, Mardi Gras Day or one spy boy encountering another spy boy uh, representing two uh, encountering uh, tribes, if you will. He threatens to set the flag on fire Crawford set phrases chanted by Mardi Gras Indians to music with song. Crawford himself states that he had no idea what the words mean and that he originally sang the phrase Chacomo, but the title was misheard by Chess Records and Checker Records president Leon Chess, who misspelled it as Giacomo for the record's release. 
James Crawford gave a 2002 interview with Offbeat Magazine discussing the song's meaning. In the interviewer asked, how did you construct Giacomo? Crawford says, it came from two Indian chants and I put music to Ico Ico. It was like a victory chant that the Indians would shout. Giacomo was a chant that was called when the Indians went into battle. I just put them together and made a song of them. Really, it was just like Lordy Miss Claudie. That was a phrase everybody in New Orleans used. Lloyd Price just added music to it and it became a hit. Yeah, I was well. just trying to write a catchy song, he says. The interviewer says, listeners wonder what Giacomo means. Some music scholars says it translates into Mardi Gras Indian lingo, such as kiss my ass. Mm -hmm. And I've read where some think Giacomo was a court jester. What does it mean, the interviewer asks. Crawford says, I really don't know. And, and, and he just kind of laughs. Now, the Dixie Cups version was a result of an unplanned jam in the New York City recording studio, where they began an impromptu version of Ico Ico, accompanying themselves with drumsticks on an aluminum chair, a studio ashtray, and a Coke bottle. After their producers cleaned up the track and added the background voices, bass, and drums to the song, the single was released in March 1965. The Dixie Cup scored an international hit with the single Ico Ico in May of 1965 on the Billboard Hot 100 chart with their version peaked at number 20 and spent 10 weeks on the top 100. The song also charted at number 23 on the UK singles chart and peaked at number 20 on the R&B chart. In Canada, Ico Ico reached number 26 on the RPM chart. It was the third single taken from their debut album, Chapel of Love, issued on Redbird Records, August 1964. The Dixie Cups had learned Ico Ico from hearing the Hawkins singer's grandmother sing it, but they knew little about the origin of the song. So the original authorship credit went to the members, Barbara Ann Hawkins, her sister Rosalie Hawkins, and their cousin Joanne Marie Johnson. The Dixie Cups version was later included on the soundtrack to the 1987 film, The Big Easy. This same version was also used on the soundtrack of 2005 film, The Skeleton Key. Another very controversial movie that uh, only feeds many of the misconceptions and ignorance that many people have about voodoo, hoodoo, root work, and, and indeed conjure. In 2009, a version based on the Dixie Cups was used in the ad for Lipton Rainforest Alliance Ice Tea. So legal battles ensued. After the Dixie Cups version of Ico Heiko was a hit in 1965, they and their record label, Redbird Records, were sued by James Crawford who claims that Ico Ico was the same as his composition, Giacomo. Although the Dickie Cups denied that their two compositions were similar, the lawsuit resulted in a settlement in 1967 with Crawford making no claim to authorship or ownership of Ico Ico, but being credited 25% for public performances such as on radio of Ico Ico in the United States. A comparison of the two recordings demonstrates the shared lyric and melody between the two songs. Though the arrangements are different in tempo, instrumentation and harmony, Crawford's rationale for the settlement was motivated by years of legal battles with no royalties. In the end, he stated, I don't even know if I really am getting my just dues. I just figure 50% of something is better than 100% of nothing. In the 1990s, the Dixie Cups became aware that another group of people were claiming authorship of Ico Ico the ex-manager Joe Jones and his family filed a copyright copyright registration in 1991, alleging that they wrote the song in 1963. Joe Jones successfully licensed Ico Ico outside of North America, and the Dixie Cups filed a lawsuit against Joe Jones. The trial took place in New Orleans, and the Dixie Cups were represented by well-known music attorney Oren Warshawski, Warshawski, before senior federal judge Peter Beer. The jury returned a unanimous verdict on March 6, um, 2002, affirming that the Dixie Cups were the only writers of Ico Ico and granting them more money than they were seeking. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals upheld the jury verdict and sanctioned Joe Jones. New Orleans singer and pianist Dr. John covered Ico Ico in 1972 
for his fifth studio album, Dr. John's Gumbo, released as a single in March 1972 on Atco Records. His version of the song charted at number 71 on the Billboard Hit 100 chart. It was produced by Jerry Wexler and Harold uh, Baptiste. The Ico Ico story is told by Dr. John in the linear notes to his 1972 album, Dr. John's Gumbo, in which he covers New Orleans R&B classic. The song was written and recorded back in the early 1950s by a New Orleans singer named James Crawford, he wrote, who worked under the name of Sugar Boy and the Cane Cutters. It was recorded in 1960 by the Dixie Cups for Jerry Lieber and Mike Stroll's Redbird Records, but the format we are following here is Sugar Boy's original. Uh, I'm gonna skip ahead to uh, what I think is more important with the time that we have remaining and that is its linguistic origins. Linguistics, linguistics and, hu, hu, and historians have proposed a variety of origins for the seemingly nonsensical course, suggesting that the words may come from a lounge of cultures. An interpretation in Louisiana Creole French is ane ane aku aku an die, chakamo fino wana ne, chakamo fina ne, Translation, hey now, hey now, listen, listen at the back. All our love made our king be born. All our love made it happen. But linguistics, Jeffrey or Geoffrey D. Kimball derives the lyrics of the song in part from Mobilian jargon, an extinct American Indian tribe or trade language consistent mostly of Choctaw and Chickasaw words and once used by Southeastern American Indians, Blacks, and European settlers and their descendants in the Gulf Coast region. In Mobilian jargon, Chacamo Fina, interpreted as Chacamo Fino, was commonly used phrase meaning very good. Another possible translation interprets the third and fourth lines as Chacamo Fina an Don Die, Chacamo Fina an Ye. Chickasaw word, chakama, it's good, and fina, meaning very. Creole, and dandier, from French Creole, an dandier, at the back, and the Creole, ane, and the French ani, meaning year. It's a very, it's very good at the rear, it's a very good year. In 2009, offbeat article, the Ghanaian socialist linguist Evershed Amuzu said the chorus was definitely West African, reflecting the tonal patterns of the region. He notes that the phrase Ayeko, Aiko, Aiko, often doubled as Aiko or Ayeko, is a popular chant meaning well done or, congratul or congratulations among the Akan and the Ewe people in modern Togo, Ghana, and Benin. Both groups were frequently taken in the slave trade, although Haiti, often through Haiti to Louisiana. Ewe in particular are credited with bringing West African cultural influence of Voodooan rights to Haiti and to New Orleans. Musicologist Ned Sublittle has backed the idea that the chorus might have roots in Haitian slave culture, considering that the rhythms of Mardi Gras Indians are nearly indistinguishable from the Haitian Kata rhythm. Yakimo, he has also noted, was a common name among the Taino inhabitants of Haiti in the early years of the slave trade. Yakimo Finaye is also, whether uh, coincidentally or not, the phrase, the black cat is here. In the language of the Bambara people, a West African Mandane language. And according to the Whitney Plantation archives, a largest portion of the enslaved right here came from the particular Bambara group. In the 1991 lecture in the New Orleans Social Science Historian Association, Sybil Kine proposed the following translation from Yoruba and Creole, code language, God is watching, Jockeyman causes it, we will be emancipated, Jockeyman urges it, we will wait. So Louisiana practitioners would recognize many aspects of the song as having elements about spirit possession. The practitioner, the horse, waves a flag, 
representing a certain God, called that God into him or herself. Setting a flag on fire, of course, would be considered a, a curse or a negative act. The man in green who either uh, changes personality or whose appearance is deceiving would be recognized in voodoo as possessed by a peaceful rata spirit inclined to green clothing and love magic or the-, the Excuse me. Excuse me. Um, we've got we to gotta wrap up. Is there somewhere that we could go to see that? Is that somewhere- Wikipedia, there are several versions to this. So make sure you put in um, Ico Ico lyrics, Wikipedia. Thank you. We have one last question and people are wanting to know how you all feel about non-African um, descended people practicing um, New Orleans voodoo. I don't think so, no. No, I don't agree with that. <laughs> no. 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 I Political. think it depends. I think it depends, and I'm gonna let I'm gonna let the divine prince finish out. But I think it depends on what their journey is. So I would have to know what the person's journey is. But just to do it, just to be doing it, no. But it might be some kind of able or something where they want them to do a certain stuff to admin. Maybe they were a slave master and they have to learn to bow down. People have personal journeys and things that they need to learn on their walk in life. So that's the only way I would look at it. But just to say I'm going to practice it, you haven't been initiated into anything. No, 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 no. Yeah, I agree. Um, one, as a, as a minister and a spiritual practitioner, uh, it is not my call to step into people's destiny. So I, I, as a, a reader and a practitioner, I have to read a person's destiny authentically and accurately as they approach me. But just like my attitude about classes, if you talk about training, initiating, coming into the practice of tradition, in this politically correct climate, I'm going to offer you to gather your DNA, to, to pull your Ancestry.com, to pull your 23andMe. Who are you really? And, and as uh, Kishana said, you know, it, it could be your ancestors coming through to make amends. I also think that we have overgeneralized the idea of race. Uh, and when we start looking at DNA, you start finding out who really got uh, West, Western European ancestry, who really has, you know, African ancestry. Often, in my experience, uh, the client will, will usually make the right, respectable choice as to what they're then going to pursue uh, as it relates to coming into the, to the practice and the tradition. And I would have to agree with that as well. I say no, no. 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 Okay. I say no, no. I say, I say, I say no, no. No, no. No, no. In order, in order to um, to come into the religion, is as if I would open up a Chinese restaurant and say that I am a Chinese and I'm selling Chinese food. I mean, I could be married to a Chinese and have been living together and have Chinese children, but at the end of the day, I'm still going to be an African American. So, if you want to practice something that's really traditional African American. You have to really find out, as they said, what your journey is, why you want to find this, what, what is God guiding you in this direction. But you truly cannot call yourself an African American or African American religion if you're not truly African American. All right. Well, I really appreciate your time, your energy, your blessings, your songs. Um, to helping us understand how voodoo is having a, a manifestation on Mari Brade, and you all are all doing that and keeping Marie alive, keeping our ancestors alive. And we thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I am Divine Prince at houseofthedivineprince.com to respond to the chat. Right, thank you too. Thank you all so much for a beautiful Thanks. program, for all of your insight, and to everyone in the chat for your comments and questions as well. There will be more programs coming in the future in connection with Mystery in Motion, so please keep an eye on the website and our newsletter. 
Um, and please come see this free motion before it closes this November. Thank you to Kim, to Cinnamon Black, to Big Chief Alfred Doucette, to the Divine Prince Ty Amica, <coughs> Anna Jones Lee. Thank you all for a beautiful <coughs> And have a good night. Night. Good 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 yeah, your baby says good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, Prince. Good night, good night.